Hi, my name is Mark Thorsby, and this is Phenomenology. In this video, we'll be taking a look at one of uh, at Hus Edmund Husserl's text, Ideas Pertaining to a Pure Phenomenology and to a Phenomenological Philosophy, first book, also referred to as Ideas One. So welcome back, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Um, in this section, this video, we're going to be taking a look at part two of his text, chapter four. This is the last section the last chapter of this part, and then we'll be moving to part three in the next video. Uh, but this chapter is somewhat short, uh, but there's a lot of important stuff going on here. And for those of you who've been reading along with Husserl, uh, by no doubt at this point, you recognize that Husserl is really going actually quite slowly and really um, trying to really fill in an exhaustively, well, not he says not exhaustively, but systematically lay the foundations for this eidetic science. And we're going to sort of talk about that at the end of today's video. Uh, the title for this chapter is The Phenomenological Reductions. And you'll see that really Husserl is now doing phenomenology in a more proper sense. It's still very early on because now he's talked about this idea that we have this ability to exclude. Uh, he calls it the, our exclusion of the general positing of things, right? The general, when we experience reality, reality feels... Um, that is our, we have these experiences and if we assume that those are not real or we suspend the general positing that seems to accompany um, these perceptions and just analyze them as perceptions, right? Um, then what we can do here is that we can, that is the first sort of major reduction. But you'll see here in the last chapter, Husserl looked at pure consciousness and we saw that even that the reduction has a limit, right? This phenomenological reduction, the epoch, the epoch, it has a limit and its limit is it, you can't reduce out the pure consciousness as such, right? These, there's pure mental processes which are taking place and even this general exclusion that you can do uh, that he talked about in our previous videos, this isn't operable for pure consciousness. So this is important because this means that Husserl set a boundary in terms of what phenomenology can do. So this is this means that he's demarcating the scientific um, frame around which phenomenology um, is, is operating here. So in these sections here, you're gonna see what Husserl is really talking about is, he's gonna talk a little bit more about what we can and can't do. And he's also gonna introduce in this video, we'll talk about it, it doesn't interest in the video, but in the book, he, um, he was going to introduce his conception of uh, parenthesizing. And well, I've talked about that briefly. We're going to see that he has a more specific mind for that terminology and that concept in this chapter. So that's what we're taking a look at. And of course, at the very end of today's talk, uh, Husserl will argue that even though we're making these phenomenological reductions, at the end of the day, the phenomenologist is not a dogmatist, right? And that is, we're still open to other scientific considerations, other philosophical insights, so far at, insofar as they, they refer to um, the eidetic sphere, right? The sphere of essences, the ontology of essences that he's trying to uncover here. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about ontology as well. So let's sort of jump into it here. Um, section 56, the, the section here is, he begins with the question about the range of phenomenological reductions, right? Uh, and so, Keep in mind here that the exclusion of nature is a methodical means. And so when we exclude the actuality of nature, right, and then I just analyze my perceptions insofar as their mental formations in my imminent experience, right, um, that I, I'm having, right, they're, they're happening and they're, that's how I know them, right, they're immediately given to me as it were, right. So when we make this general exclusion, the phenomenological epochs, we're doing it for methodical reasons, right. And, and so he says, well, that means we've got to take seriously some of these methodological questions for phenomenology. Um, so for instance, uh, some of the initial observation, what are some of the initial um, observations of the effects of exclusion? Well, he writes this, that all individual objectivities which become constituted by axiological and practical functionings of consciousness are excluded. So, so we're talking here is what's the range of the exclusion? Well, anything that has to do with value, right? That's what axiological refers to here, is any sort of function in consciousness which is about ascribing values to things, right? That's excluded. 
right? Practical functionings, right? So any sorts of states of consciousness, which are about practicality, right? Practicality is always premised upon a memory of what's actual. That's how you know what's practical and what works. That is also excluded. So that means that what? It means that all of the cultural, scientific, and aesthetic works, and works here doesn't just mean uh, books or paintings here, right? Uh, but what we're doing is we're, we're excluding all of these sorts of sciences and all of the sorts of knowledge that comes along with them out of our consideration. So that's all gone, right? So that means that, for instance, a, a person who's doing phenomenology, at least at this transcendental level, cannot also be doing cultural theory um, as such, right? Or at least, um, though you can say that there are clearly... Um, implications for cultural theory from whatever the eidetic sphere might give us in the phenomenological reduction but um we can't start off with sort of cultural theory and move our way in right so that means that the phenomenologist for instance even someone like myself right um i'm very much persuaded by certain tenets of marxist theory um i wouldn't say i'm a full blo full-blooded marxist right but there's a lot to it that i think is good uh they're right but you can see here that when you're conducting the phenomenological reduction, all of that Marxist business, uh, or if you want, Nozick, right? You can have him on, on the other side. All of those theories get put out aside, right? Those are gone because we can only um, attend to that which is imminently present in our intentional comportments, right? We have to describe the phenomenological reduction is we ignore the reality of things. We exclude that. And that means by doing so, we lose all of these scientific practices. But this actually clarifies things because then it allows us to actually analyze consciousness in, um, in its imminent description, right? So that means that state, right? So politics, custom, law, religion, all of this is excluded. All of this is excluded. So the cultural and scientific sciences, sciences are themselves excluded. So what's the range of it? Well, the first sort of realization is that the range is that a lot of the knowledge that we typically employ, even on a common day-to-day -day level, history, etc., all of that is excluded. All of that's excluded. So here's the question. Wait, can we exclude the pure ego, right? So this is the question about the exclusion of the pure ego. Does, does the phenomenological reduction um, also exclude the I? Now, here's the, this is the German term I here, ich. Um, and so for us, it would be the exclusion of the I, right? And think here, by the way, just stop for a moment and think about how frequently we use the term I, right? I'm going to the store, I'm watching a video lecture, um, I'm drinking coffee, right? All of those things, right? We're constantly using this, the language of the I, the self, right? But you can see here is that the general exclusion here, right? This uh, here would mean that the human being gets excluded insofar as they're a natural being, right? So myself as an animal, right, populating the world, that's excluded, right? Myself as a personal being gets excluded, right? Um, and also my, 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 I get excluded in terms of being a social being, right? Because now since I've excluded and bracketed out, um, the reality of these things to reduce them simply to um, uh, a presentation of consciousness, right? That means that there's no nature, there's no natural object, there's no physical thing for me to consider, right? That the, that logic gets excluded. But me as a personal being is a lot of that too, right? And of course, me as a social being because I've excluded others, right? So where am I exactly? To what extent am I still there at all? Well, okay, on the one hand, we won't find the pure ego as a transcendental residuum, he says, right? On the one hand, you can't find it, find the ego as a transcendental residuum in the normal way that we would, that we recall here in a previous example of how he used Descartes here as an example of what a residuum is. And there should be two U's in that, I see that right now. Um, but there's no residuum of the pure ego. Why? Because the ego is the subject of what's happening, of consciousness itself, right? So there is a transcendental ego. That is, there must therefore be something that's, that there must be a structure that's a priori to the 
um, to the ego, to our normal personal sense of our ego, right? So I have my own conception of self, but there must be an a priori structure which makes it possible for me to have the type of experience then, because I'm different than other selves, right? Um, and so, but you're not going to find that in a transcendental residuum, because when you make the reduction, it's still the ego that's doing the reducing, right? So, but on the other hand, the pure ego does seem to be continuous in consciousness as something that's essentially necessary. Um, and, there, and it's here, and I think in many ways, I think that there's this, is, this represents a real struggle in Husserlian phenomenology in order to articulate what exactly is happening here with the ego. And I, in many ways, I think that Husserl is in the same position as Kant. Um, and, and you'll recall that Kant's conception of the ego is that it's an essential necessity but that's sort of it. Um, and that there's more to it than that, of course, right? So, and it's sort of, then I love it. One of the things I love in Husserl is when he starts to give these descriptions, these phenomenological descriptions sort of littered throughout his text here. He says the ego is, is the coming and the going of mental process, right? The ego is the sort of coming and going, right, that we have. Um, and again, he's trying to describe this experience of what it is intuitionally, uh, which is really quite difficult to do. Uh, and I'm not sure, I'm not convinced he does it all the way, and I don't think he would be either, right? And in fact, he even quotes Kant here, right? Um, and quote, here's this quote from Kant, the I think, remember, I think therefore I am in Descartes, the I think must be capable of accompanying all of my presentations, right? So even though I don't experience the transcendental ego directly in any way, because it's the subject of what is experiencing, right? All of my presentations are coming in through this thing. So that means it must be capable of accompanying them, right? By necessity. So the pure ego is a transcend transcendency within the imminency itself. The, the imminent, the there and now, the this is happening um, actual presentation in consciousness, right? That imminent moment, the pure ego must be transcended for it because it has to accompany all the presentations by necessity. So what does that mean? It means that the phenomenological exclusion excludes my personal sense of ego, but it doesn't. Ex it does not exclude my ego at a fundamental level. Um, okay. So next sort of question here: What about when I make this phenomenological reduction? What about God? <laughs> right. Uh, the transcendency God excluded. So. In the phenomenological reduction, I suspend the actuality of the natural world, but what about God? And this is sort of interesting here. And you get the sense, you know, I mean, you start to see here uh, the theological um, concerns that Husserl has. Um, and, and you see this throughout the text, sort of littered throughout, but ever so slightly. Um, and because he's, he's, he knows that this is not the province of his investigation, uh, but it's on his mind, and really it's probably on everyone's mind. Uh, minus our staunch atheists who have already decided. All right, so there's something interesting here, but because if there is a God, right, God is not ever perceived, right? Uh, if there is a God, and I'm thinking in a, in a monotheistic sense, if there is a God, God is never perceived as such, right? Um, I perceive the world, and in the world, everything is changing. God, insofar as God it would be infinite, and unchanging, right, could never be subject to perceptual, to perception in consciousness by definition. Because to do so would be to, would be to force the unchanging into the changing, right? That would be sort of one argument here. And he doesn't, Husserl doesn't go through this, but this is how I'm trying to explain the importance of it, of what he's asking here. So, but here's the deal, is that if there's a God, then God is never subject to that. And so when I make this general exclusion, am I excluding God, right? Because God's never subject to anything I've described in terms of my general positing. So does the phenomenological epoch exclude God, right? Well, here's what he argues on, on 110 in the Husserliana. Reduction of the natural world to the absolute of consciousness yields factual concatenations of mental processes of consciousness. I'm going to stop right there, right? So when I, the reduction of the natural world to absolute consciousness, when I make this phenomenological reduction, what I get out of it are factual concatenations of mental processes of consciousness, right? I'm getting what's factually actually happening, right? In consciousness, right? 
uh, and there are, but there are certain kinds with distinctive orders and organizations, and they can be morphologically ordered, right? Within this sphere of empirical intuition, and this becomes constituted as their intentional correlates, right? So that's the first sort of thing. Is there. So what actually happens when I reduce to the natural world is I still have factual concatenations, right? Uh, because it's imminently given, right? And so you can see here, and this is where he sort of mentions something quite fascinating. He says, he says, and these these factual concatenations reveal what looks like would look to be recognizable tautologies, and you can see he gets really excited here, uh, because he starts to sort of re see that the, in some ways it looks as if there's this sort of teleology here that we can trace out, right? Now, and he says, but if there were an otherworldly divine being, it would be absolute in a sense that's different from that of absolute consciousness, right? Um, so. So he doesn't really follow up with this, his discussion of teleologies. I think he's just, I think he just gets excited as a theologian here. Um, but ultimately here, the reduction of the natural world gives us absolute consciousness, but the absolute consciousness that we're getting would not be the type of absolute consciousness that we're talking about with God. Why? One of the answers is quite simple. Namely, that our consciousness is tied to our bodies, right? Um, it is tied to the general positing of the substantial natural world. One of the things we see here is that every time there's consciousness, there is in fact some sort of natural body, right? We talked about that in the previous video and recall Husserl's discussion of his conception of animalia, right? Uh, the idea of the animate organisms, right? So with the phenomenological reduction excludes this other absolute existence as well. So. We, so in terms of how far we're extending the phenomenological reduction, even though there's these interesting questions about God, because ab absolute co transcendent consciousness for us is, um, what is not the same as the absolute transcendence of a God, if there is a God, then that means that the phenomenological reduction excludes that as well. So that means theology is out. Theology is out at this moment. And by the way, here's quite interesting to consider that there are a range of eminent theologians who are phenomenologists. And so I, I encourage you to, to seek out some of their work, right? Um, it's not often well known that uh, John Paul II, Pope John Paul II, was a phenomenologist, in fact. Um, and he, in fact, has a book and a number of books on this. And so it's worth taking a look at the relationship of theology and phenomenology. Um, I would, you know, I would look at... Um, Pope John Paul II's work, and you'll see what his arguments are. Um, so, but at this fundamental level, phenomenology excludes even that, right? Um, and remember, it suspends it, it brackets it, it puts it away, right? Um, and of course, by the way, you could also say this too, to go back here, is that in the same sense that the atheist makes the argument that there is no God, they're making an argument about an absolute otherworldly existence. So that means that that in the same sense that the phenomenological exclusion also would exclude any dogmatic prescription regarding God one way or another, right? God is just simply not going to be discussed here uh, because it's completely excluded as um, something given uh, accessible for our, for our absolute consciousness, the consciousness of the phenomenological investigator. Okay, so that means we've lost the world culture, we've lost the sciences, We've lost God, right? So that, those things are out. Now, the tr let's talk about the transcendency of the identity and the exclusion of pure logic as uh, mathesis universalis, right? The universality of mathematics and logic, right? Can we exclude that, right? Um, so, okay, I've gotten rid of all the sciences, but can I get rid of logic here, right? And here I want you to think um, very closely about this and I encourage you to watch one of my other videos it's called it's on appendix on the philosophy of logic in my introduction to formal logic series take a look at that but one of the things you'll see is that what is logic all about logic is about articulating formal structures of validity in reasoning right um, that are independent of what those things mean right uh, they're variables right Formal logic is about um, a relationship of variables, and that's where we derive a conception of validity. We don't derive it from content. So in the, in the phenomenological exclusion, we're bracketing out of the content, right? But 
can we get rid of the logic, right? Isn't that still in operation? And you can see here, think about mathematics, right? And think about the idea that one can only, right, understand given, the, you know, a specific set of rules for mathematics, one can only understand a theorem in one way, right? You can only understand the quadratic equation in one way, right? Um, and that's because of the necessity that's given in, in the concepts that mathematics and logic deals with, right? And of course, these concepts in consciousness, right, are essences, right? Uh, or at least in consciousness, there's presentations that seem to go back and trace back to certain essences, such that even if we want to square a circle, we can't do it, right? As hard as we try to imagine it, the essence of a, of a circle is such that it's not going to be squared unless you, I mean, radically transform the rules of dimensionality, right? So it looks like this stuff is totally universal. So can we really exclude this? Maybe this is the, maybe this is the limit of phenomenological reduction. Well, Husserl takes us here, right? He says, okay, well, when we talk, he says that after excluding all the individual realities, right? So once we exclude all this sort of individualized stuff, right, there are these other transcendencies, um, and they seem to be universal objects, right? In mathematics here, right? Um, but these are not really inherent in pure consciousness itself, because recall to the previous chapter when Husserl suggests he said, let's imagine that we destroy the validity of all of our perceptions, and all right. Then at that point, that would mean that mathematics would no longer operate any longer, because mathematics does, and the logic is given to us through a sort of sequentiality. Um, in consciousness. Now, would the rules of validity still pertain? On the one hand, yes, they would still, but we would never be able to come to them in any, in any way, right? So what does this mean? It means that these universal transcendent objects in mathematics and logic, these things, these concepts, these essences, right? They're not really in a part of pure consciousness as self. So you might want to say that they're, they're a priori um, um, compared to the natural sciences, mathematics has an a priori position, but it's not the a priori of consciousness as such. So how can we make sense of this, right? Well, to each, re Husserl says, to each regionally delimitable sphere of individual being, there belongs an ontology, right? So an ontology here, let's just say this, is that ontos refers to being, right? And so we're just talking about ontology is the analysis and the study of the way in which different forms of being have relationality to other forms of being and to themselves, right? So ontology is the study of being in its general formulation, right? And we know this, we should say this, is that um, the scientist who's uncovering the world, right, is uncovering a physical ontology, right? They're articulating a physical ontology. They're articulating what's physically the case for these beings and all beings of this kind or something like this, right? But logic also has an ontology. So the mathematician is also involved in an ontology, but they're talking about the being of these ideas, right? The being of an essence, ultimately. And you can see here that phenomenology is much, it's, it, the irony here is that phenomenology is much closer to mathematics than it is of descriptive psychology, and it's also much closer um, to mathematics than it is to a sort of empirical observation of the world. So this is this I think is creates a lot of the problems because a lot of people hear the term phenomenology and they think, oh, it's about what you see, what you experience. Not really, yes and no, right? Because you can see it's not about what you experience; it's rather about how you experience, right? Um, and how you experience forces us into an a priori transcendental discussion about certain types of ontologies, right? In fact, he gives these examples. He says, the ontology of nature belongs to physical objects, and the ontology of psychophysical being to the psychophysical, right? Uh, so psychology ha does, does provide us with an ontological description of things, but only insofar as it's categorized, right? So when we talk about ontology, let me scoot back here a little bit. <laughs> there's, we might make at least this distinction that there's a material ontology on the one hand and there's a formal ontology on the other. Both of these are eidetic spheres, right? Both of these are eidetic spheres. Uh, but what we can say about formal ontology is that you can't doubt 
right? Um, the formal logicality of things, because it's the means by which one doubts. That is, the the uh, the the phenomenological reduction cannot actually exclude formal logic in the universal features of mathematics and rationality as such. Why? Because because if you doubt those, then that means the exclusion itself is undermined, right? So you can't, these things can't be doubted without the collapse of the exclusion itself, which means that this is a limit for the phenomenological epoch. You can't actually doubt that. Um, so that does mean that there is, so the, so the, the, the transcendency of the eidetic means that there are certain universal features formally that we're not going to exclude, actually. Uh, so, but Husserl wants to be very careful here. At least that's how I read him. And he wants to argue that, okay, so we still have certain logical, we still have certain uh, logical, uh, lo that is, logic still applies, right, even to the phenomenologist. And so you can't exclude that. Uh, but he's worried that you don't want to then um, turn phenomenology into just a logical absolutization, right? To just extend logic and the theorems of logic and philosophy of logic and so on and so forth, right? Why? Because ultimately phenomenology ha is doing the exclusion so that we can begin the process of describing uh, and, and evaluating these eidetic structures, right? So you want to be careful here not to um, smuggle in a whole bunch of formal logical theory uh, that will ultimately undermine the process of pure description. Because phenomenology is supposed to be a pure description. It's not supposed to be a, um, a criticism in, in the reduction itself, right? So every pure mental process, he says at 112, is also subsumed under the logically broadest sense of the word object, right? So anytime we use the term object in phenomenology, all of these mental processes are included. And it appears that we're consequently unable to exclude formal logic or formal ontology. So we can't actually exclude that. But he says what we'll do is we'll parenthesize formal logic, right? We'll sort of, and this is, of course, uh, an operation of formal logic, right? Is to, is to, is to parenthesize something uh, and not to look at it. Now, it raises a sort of question, which is namely informal logic. When one brackets something out, uh, that's all well and good. But when you put it back, when you unbracket formal logic, right? Um, you better not have a contradiction there. And his argument here is that because we're using um, logic in, our, in, in the operation of the mind, right? It's in action that we don't have to go referencing all these theories. The only thing that we really need to do in phenomenology is we need to reference the axioms um, that are necessary because we're not doing logic. We're not doing mathematics. Uh, in phenomenology, we depend upon them. We're going to parenthesize them out, um, and we shouldn't find a contradiction later. He doesn't talk about this contradiction problem, but it seems to me it's something worth considering. Um, because remember, phenomenology, again, is purely description by pure intuition. So one does not need a recourse to refer to logical theorems here. The only reference we need in phenomenology are the axioms themselves. And then we'll, and that, that means that we can maintain the exclusion as a practice, right? So here's sort of, he sort of steps back a little bit and says, you know, on the one hand, you can't exclude formal logic because you need formal logic. But what we can do is we can parenthesize it out and bracket it out. So that way we can keep faithful to our practice of only attending to what is given to us um, in this field of consciousness as a phenomena, right? Yeah, because that's where the eidetic is given. And so... So he wants to stick with that, and so he really wants to avoid um, overly burdening um, our conception of phenomenology with these things, and so he uses this term to parenthesize. Okay, so now let's talk about the exclusion of the material eidetic disciplines, right? So here's the thing. We can't extend the conclusion uh, to the region of pure consciousness, right? Exclusion, right? So we can't exclude pure consciousness. We've talked about that at length. So that means there's an a priori that belongs to consciousness, right? There's something um, a priori necessary and beforehand of consciousness. Now, the goal of phenomenology is the explication of the es of essence, right? Uh, that's ultimately the goal. It's an eidetic science, right? Um, and eidetic means essence here. So it's the essence of these concepts. 
Now, the essences which I experience as singular events are not universal features of consciousness. And let me stop back here and tell you why he's thinking about this. Okay, so the goal is the explication. Here's the problem, is that even when I do the exclusion, right? So I don't, I'm not going to assume that this coffee cup isn't real. I'm going to assume that none of this has actuality. And so now, now I can think about all of my experiences merely with as states within the phenomenal field of consciousness. These are all just mental states I'm seeing. I have a black lamp, I have a bookshelf here, etc., etc. But all of these are just mere presentations to me, right? Um, but notice how they're always coming. So as I look around, they sort of keep flowing in and in and in, right? Um, and they look and they, and they have concatenations, etc., right? Um, but these are all singular events in consciousness. In fact, it's as if my stream of consciousness is just a sort of unmediated flux of these individual singular events in consciousness. And what he wants to argue here is that the goal of phenomenology isn't the study of those things, right? This pure study. And he says that ultimately the exclusion excludes those as well because the exclusion is aimed at trying to understand the essences of something. But this sort of unmediated flux of perceptual information that's given in this field of perception, right? None of that is essence. All of it corresponds and is somehow correlated with an essence, right? So for instance, I have a concept of what a lamp is, and there's some there's an essence there in that concept. I can only use that concept in certain ways, right? I can't think of a lamp um, um, in a different dimension of space, right? I can't think of a lamp as two-dimensional, for instance. So, uh, and so on and so forth. I can't think, so I can't think of a lamp that uh, by, in principle, never emits any light whatsoever. That's not a lamp, right? So there's something essential to the concept. And somehow my perception of the lamp here is correlated, but this individual flux of perception is not the essence, right? I mean, what we're after are these universal features of consciousness. So that means we can actually exclude those. There's different spheres of essences, and we can distinguish and describe this difference in terms of, on the one hand, using the term the, in, the immanental, right? I'm not pronouncing that well. The, what's imminent, right? So this flux of perceptions I'm getting constantly, this is the imminent, right? The transcendent is this a priori that we were referring to earlier, right? So that means that, uh, and here it's important that even the phenomenologist is always exploring what's the case in the imminent consciousness, but they're not concerning themselves with the, the individual singular events, right? That's the key here. So what does phenomenolo phenomenology not do? What is, what's the limit here of phenomenology? Well, regarding the imminent, so when we're talking about the imminent, we're not positing essences about the imminent singular event. We're not making statements about the validity or the non-validity of these events. We're not making statements about how they could, the, their ideal possibilities, and we're not establishing eidetic laws from these individual imminent singular events, right? Because nothing within, within the stream of imminent consciousness is considered a transcendental individual. Now, this term transcendental individual is Husserl's term here, uh, but these aren't transcendental individuals, right? These are um, singular, right? So this is an important sort of difference. He seems to, to use language to refer to the singular in terms of the imminent and the individual as the transcendent. Because we, so you might say, go back to the lamp problem, that my concept of the lamp, right, this essence refers to a, a concept, an eidetic individual, right, that somehow is transcendentally constituted in some way, right? But my experience of the singular lamp is not the same, okay? So, because of the exclusion of the imminent, the applicability of the material sciences gets totally suspended, right? So we can't apply the material sciences either. Uh, why? Because the material sciences are constituted by the observation of the imminent. Think about the, um, uh, the field scientist who's in the, in the trees in the Amazonian rainforest, you know, recording bird calls right? There's someone out there, right? They're in a tree right now. What are they doing exactly? Well, they're making observations of imminent experience. Now, of course, they're also naturalists. We won't talk about that. 
But that's ultimately what they're doing. And because we're excluding the imminent and the validity of all that stuff, that means the material science is no longer, or their applicability also gets suspended. And importantly, it gets suspended, not rejected, right? Husserl is not an anti-scientist, right? He's not against science at all, right? In fact, you might even say that the whole enterprise here, in many ways, is about ultimately having a firmer foundation for the sciences, um, so as to avoid the sort of scholasticism of the scientific that is that is under that is underway, right? Um, sort of so, and I know that's controversial, right? Anyway, okay, so let's look here at number sixty-one. So in this section, Husserl wants to say something about the methodological significance of the systematic theory of phenomenological reductions. Okay, so the first point here is, of course, we have to avoid the, psychologi the psychologization of the identic, right? By the way, I just have to say, it's sort of funny, teaching this and going over this, it, Husserl gives us the hardest set of words to say in any presentation ever, right? Uh, so I, I appreciate your um, deference and um, sympathy for me as I as I sometimes <laughs> screw up the pronunciation of these words because uh, there's sometimes tongue twisters. But right, but his idea here is that we have to avoid the psychologization of the eidetic. So we because when we talk about these concepts, so go back to the my example of the lamp I just gave. It's it's very very tempting to start to psychologize that, right? Um, and of course, that's what psychologists do, right? And that's not a problem, but the phenomenologist is after the essence, right? So it's not about, we need to avoid this sort of psychologization. That is, the essences are not to be regarded as physical structures. Now, this, this sort of physicalism is not the only form of psychologization that's possible, right? Uh, but this is the most prominent, right? So many of you have even been thinking, okay, we've been talking about phenomena phenomenology, we've been talking about these transcendental structures, but at the end of the day, aren't we really just talking about neurons firing? Aren't we just talking about, uh, I guess, neurochromatic or neurological structures, that is, physical structures, right? Doesn't this stuff have to be up there somehow, right? This, if that has been your impulse, then Husserl recognizes that impulse here as a psychologization. That's not what we're going to do, right? Because we're excluding all of that, right? We've excluded all of our knowledge of the material sciences and neuroscience, so there's no recourse to that, right? Again, phenomenology is about the description of essences, really by essences, right? Um, so we can't regard these as physical structures, right? Why? Well, these, this whole idea, right, um, of the physical structure, the psychologization of the eidetic, this is governed by a move of practical consciousness, right? Um, it's practical, but you can see there that is in violation of the general exclusion of this general positing of the natural, this the suspension of the natural attitude and the suspension of our general positing regarding the actuality of things. So Husserl has this to say that, and let me make it a little bigger here, anyone who regards ideas, essences as physical structures, anyone who in the case of the, those operations of consciousness in which the concepts of color, shape, etc. are attained on the basis of an exemplificatory intuition of physical things with their color, shapes, etc., that person confuses the resulting consciousness of essences from the essences themselves. That is, they're taking uh, the essence of the lamp and confusing it with the essence of with the essences themselves, right? Um, and they're ascribing the flux of consciousness as its really inherent component. And he says this ultimately corrupts actually both psychology and phenomenology, right? Um, and so he says you have, we have to be really, really careful here about uh, a total misunderstanding of what we're doing um, in terms of psychologization. And I'm for, I'm, for instance, I'm, I'm, one of the things that makes me think about this is the way in which I hear some of my colleagues in the other disciplines refer to phenomenology, right? I've heard people talking about phenomenology as, uh, and then giving a description of, of an experience, right? Saying, you know, or, or for instance, um, um, for instance, maybe an architect, right? Uh, we'll go through and then discuss, right? And say, well, when you walk in, you're going to feel this experience, and then this is going to experience. 
that's not a phenomenology, not in the Husserlian sense, right? That's not a, a, the logic of a phenomena, right? Uh, that's a description of your own personal phenomena. But with the movement of the general exclusion, all of that's gone, right? But he says that even that sort of the, the description of my experience, that's not even psychology either in its proper sense, right? And it's certainly not phenomenology. And so you have to be really careful here. And this is actually where it becomes very difficult, I think, um, for me, actually, in, in terms of trying to describe this um, to, to students who haven't read this before, um, who aren't familiar with what he's trying to do, it's very difficult for us not to slide into what Husserl is, is counseling us and advising us to avoid here, um, this psychologization move. And so this is really, really important. Uh, and so that's why I sort of wanted to pull your attention to that passage. Okay. So let's take a look here. This is the last section we're going to take a look at in this video. Um, and this is section 62. It's sort of at the very end. It's sort of epistemological anticipation. So what he's sort of doing is saying, you know, for those of you who were watching this video or reading this chapter, you're probably thinking, wow, the phenomenologist is really high up on their horse here, right? Uh, the ph phenomenologist, through their general exclusion, is able to really just wipe away all of the things that we've been able to prove for thousands of years, right? what right <laughs> um, that is a natural sort of reaction here you might be saying listen the phenomenologist is a dogmatist right they're basically saying that we're going to exclude everything and so we're going to dogmatically be able to reject all of the physical sciences the psychological sciences etc etc right and here who's going to say well no 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 wait a second here there's a difference uh, number one phenomenology is not a form of dogmatism and in order to recognize that, we have to see that there's a difference between dogmatism on the one hand and criticism on the other. It's also important and apparent to recognize that Husserl is involved in a um, Husserl is involved in um, in a project of excluding, that is, suspending our attribution of the natural. He's not against science. Right? But even this exclusion is not just a form of dogmatism. It's just not saying we're just going to reject everything. Right, He says that there's a difference here about we're not dogmatism. We're trying to do criticism here. We're trying to um, critically evaluate phenomena right? and consciousness and the role of consciousness in phenomena in their presentation. Right, um, So this doesn't mean that phenomenology exor um, ignores eidetic insights that's made that are made by other scientists and other, and other frames of reference right this means that we can in fact actually learn from people who have done people who have made eidetic discoveries so we're not excluding everything possible notice we didn't even fully exclude logic here right so what does he say here quote phenomenology includes all the eidetic cognitions with which the radical problems of possibility relating to any alleged cognitions and sciences become solved, right? So basically saying, listen, we're practical and not in the normal sense, right? Uh, but essentially we're not dogmatists here. Our goal is to, is to describe and discover various problems in consciousness and try to understand them. And however we can do that, we will use the insights of others insofar as those insights um, are of the eidetic, right? Um, and so he gives an example here, Kant, right? So he says, for instance, in Kant's critique of pure reason, the first part is a transcendental deduction of the a priori, right? Take a look at it. It's absolutely fabulous. Um, and, and Husserl says, listen, even though Kant doesn't have the vocabulary or he doesn't have the frame of reference to call this a phenomenology, it is a phenomenology. How? It's a phenomenology because he's evaluating essences. It's an eidetic evaluation, right? Um, that's what he's doing. And moreover, he's, he's articulating an eidetic ontology, right? Um, that is, he's discovering, Kant is, the relationship, what's essentially necessary in being, and understand the being of what is essentially necessary, right? So, uh, so he gives this example of Kant. So Immanuel Kant is, doing, is a phenomenologist. So we've got both of these together, right? Um, so... That's sort of what's um, at stake. Um, and so you can see here is that this sort of gives us a better frame of reference of how far does the phenomenologist um, push their general exclusion and what are its limits, 
right? And you can see that the limits are we can't exclude logic and these sorts of things, but we're not, not also dogmatists, okay? So this is Phenomenology. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. I look forward to seeing you guys online for the next one.